Hi, how's it going? Hello everyone. On the bench today is Yes Welder's new flagship welder, the First S CT2050. Yes Welder calls this a 7-in-1 machine. Debates on whether this is actually a 7-in-1 aside, the welder can do DC and AC TIG, it can stick weld, and it can plasma cut with external air or using a convenient built-in air compressor. This video will be a multi-parter. I'll be testing all the modes, including lots of measurements. I'll also be taking it apart to look inside. The welder comes with a better work clamp than other Yes welders. Uh, unfortunately, it does use the same cheap, uh, stinky insulation that melts easily and aluminum cables. The electrode holder is also the same stamped steel part that comes with pretty much all Yes welders. The TIG torch is a 26 style and it's a bit bulky for my taste, but it does have an integrated torch switch and an amperage control dial, so that accounts for some of the bulk. The dial is right behind the switch, so if you want to use it while welding, it's probably going to be easiest in 4T, so that you can just press the button, then control the amperage with the knob, press the button again to turn the arc back off, rather than in 2T mode where you have to be holding the button down and then, you know, try to at the same time control the knob. But either way, uh, it doesn't come with a foot pedal, so if you wanted to control the amperage remotely, this uh, knob on the included torch switch is how you'd do it. Unless you buy the pedal, which I have done, but it's not supposedly going to ship until the end of this month or maybe even next month. So I don't have that yet, but when it shows up, I will test it with this welder. The torch connector uses the same plastic elbow that I saw on another uh, cheap torch that I looked at recently, which actually didn't allow gas to flow. Hopefully this one doesn't have that defect, but it does kind of look like the hose where it goes onto the fitting. Maybe it's too small or something. There's like a big step there. And I don't know, hopefully the hopefully that hose isn't torn, but it kind of feels odd there. So hopefully this all works okay. The plasma torch does seem better than the one that came with the MP200. I haven't gotten the consumables I ordered yet. Supposedly they're going to be shipping with a foot pedal. So hopefully the consumables on this torch hold up through the testing. If this machine cuts reliably with a built-in compressor, this might be a great go-to for quick cutting projects. I haven't actually used the welder yet, but I have powered it on and checked out some of the settings. And one thing I have noticed is that uh, while this welder does not come with a manual, one of the things that the online manual says is that of the two uh, plasma cutting modes, the cut com mode is for use with external air and just the plain cut mode is for use with the internal compressor. That sounded a little backwards to me and sure enough, when I checked it out, that's true, it, it, the cut com is actually the mode that runs with the compressor, and the cut mode is where you'll need external air. It's just a little thing, but something to note. Another thing to note is that there was a warning on the box, and I was emailed that same warning when the welder shipped, and that warning is that you should not try to weld with the plasma torch still connected to the machine. They say it can cause serious damage, so be aware of that. This welder uses high frequency start for TIG which is nice, but I wish it also had a lift start mode. Sometimes it's handy just to use lift start, plus it can be safer in situations where high frequency could affect electronics. I just prefer when welders offer both options, especially at this price and in this class of machine. The CT2050 does have an adjustable pulse mode in both AC and DC TIG, and AC TIG mode has adjustable balance and frequency. So I think the lack of lift start is a miss, but otherwise it's a pretty well-rounded TIG machine. Stick mode has adjustable hot start and arc force. There isn't a separate 6010 mode, but they do claim it'll run 6010, so we'll see how 6010 runs when we get there. This machine also claims to have power factor correction, which should help it draw less current from the wall at a given output versus a machine without. Yes, Welder claims 160 amps of max output on 120 volts, and 200 amps of max output on 240 volts in both TIG and stick welding modes. Plasma cutting is specced at 25 amps on 120 and 400, 400, sweet, that's a beast plasma cutter, and 45 amps on 240 volts. And unless I missed it, I didn't see any distinction in the specs between using the internal compressor versus using external air. So it'll be interesting to see if there's a drop in cutting performance when running off the built-in compressor. It will be pretty darn handy if it cuts as well with the built-in compressor. I mean, assuming it cuts well at all, but still. 
The plasma cutter on this machine does have a pilot arc, which is nice. The controls are pretty simple. There is a sort of auto set TIG mode for AC called AC TIG Smart. And when in that mode, you simply choose the thickness and the weld position, and it sets the amperage for you. From what I can tell, it is only for AC TIG on aluminum, and it only sets the amperage. It doesn't seem to apply any pulse settings, change the up or down slope, start or end current, or anything like that. I suppose it may still be helpful as a starting point, but there's so many variables and little things that can make a difference when TIG welding that I don't know if it's a super helpful feature. At least no more so than a chart with recommended amperages for different thicknesses and positions would have been if it had just been a paper chart that was included. And when you're in that smart mode, the moment you make any adjustment to any settings, it kicks you right out of that mode. So it's not like it stays in that mode and you can kind of tweak things. It's just if you adjust anything yourself, you're, you're on your own, which is fine. But just to be aware, it's kind of a limited feature. Other than that, it's a pretty common, straightforward control setup. It gives you sort of a sequence of operation diagram that goes across, and you just step through the different stages to set things like uh, pre and post flow, up slope, down slope, main amperage, starting amperage, ending amperage, pulse settings, AC balance, etc. You also have a button to select between 2T, 4T, or foot pedal mode, and one to choose the process. The weld position and aluminum thickness buttons only do something when you are in the AC TIG smart mode. This welder is a bit on the chunky side, but considering it's an AC-DC machine and has a built-in air compressor, it's not bad. Still, it's over 40 pounds, not including any cables or torches, so it's not the most portable thing in the world. On the back of the welder, you have a compressed air input and an output. The output is from the built-in compressor, and the air inlet is for the plasma cutter. So to use the built-in compressor, you have to run a hose from the outlet to the inlet, I imagine preferably through the included regulator water separator, and so that's how I have it set up now. They include fittings, which are very easy to quickly connect and disconnect with this included kind of semi-rigid hose, but the included regulator does not have tapered threads, even though the threads on these included fittings are tapered. So I had to use about 10 wraps of Teflon tape in order to get the fittings to seal in the regulator, and they're still not super tight. I mean, they're you know, basically hand tight by the time they bottom out. It seems like they seal, I think they'll work, but I, you know, I don't know why they wouldn't just have <laughs> the right threads in the regulator. Either way, even if it leaks a little bit, I'm sure it'll work okay. It's just compressed air. A more annoying thing is that the fitting for the Argon inlet is not a tapered seat fitting. Here are pictures of two proper tapered seat fittings. Heck, there's even a proper tapered seat fitting on the front of this welder for the TIG and plasma torch attachment, albeit with external threads instead of internal like this fitting. It's just bizarre that they don't put the right fitting on the back. There is a bit of a step in the middle of this fitting because the threads don't go all the way through, so there's just kind of a little lip of metal where one set of threads stop and the next ones start. It's not a proper seat, but uh, this is the included hose with the included fitting, and this very outer ridge of this fitting bottoms out against this little ridge inside this fitting, maybe a thread or a half a thread before this little nut bottoms out in this fitting. So if you really crank that down, it does seal well enough to probably work. And I'm mostly basing that on the fact that the S-Welder MP200 has this exact same fitting. And if I really crank that one in, it seals well enough to use. But like I said, it's just strange that they don't include the correct fitting. And the welder actually arrived with an O-ring down in that fitting. You might be able to see it down in there. And it included a bag with two additional, you know, possibly spare fittings or uh, O-rings. But the O-ring is slightly loose in there and there's nothing for it to seal against properly either. I tried carefully positioning the O-ring that was already in the fitting when I got it, which was kind of out of position. I tried carefully positioning it and threading this fitting in and it just, when it hit the uh, O-ring, it just kind of pushed it to the side and sliced it in half. So I don't think these uh, O-rings are a solution at all. And like I said, I'm sure if I crank it down, it'll probably work good enough for use, but really they should just be putting the right fitting here. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that they have to use this particular type of connection. They could have used a hose bar, a quick connect fitting, whatever, but they include a hose with an industry standard tapered fitting and they put a threaded coupler on the welder that isn't anything, and it seems to work by pure luck. It's just strange. 
The welder has connectors on the back, which apparently can be used to connect this to a CNC table. And it even includes the connectors for the wires so that you can wire it up. But unfortunately, I have no way to test that functionality. Like the MP200, there are two fans. And just like that welder, I'm assuming one is going to be for the welding components and the other one for the plasma cutting. And both of those fans do run all the time when the welder's powered up. And with that, let's open it up and take a look inside. Inside, the machine is very packed. Other than just having a peek around, I'll point out a few things that stood out to me. The compressor is on some kind of silicone mounts, so that should help isolate it from vibration and hopefully protect the rest of the machine from you know, anything working its way loose over time. The outlet hose is kind of a hard nylon type of hose with a little push-in fitting. That type of hose drops in strength quickly as it heats up, so I assume it's rated to handle the heat that this compressor will produce, but it is one of the first things I'd probably check if the internal compressor stops outputting any air. It is nice to see that there's an air filter for the compressor, and it's just a generic enough filter that I'm sure you could find a usable replacement if it ever plugged up. The ground wire coming in runs up and connects to this top corner of the board, and that's it. There are no additional ground wires running to the outer case or to any of the other structural parts inside. The board itself has a little tab right here that is screwed down into this, which I believe is how the ground of the board, which is up in the corner, gets transferred down to the case, and then from there just everything else via all the different screwed-in connections. So that's something, but overall it's not a very robust grounding setup. I'm not sure if it's just shipping damage or what, but there are a couple little plastic pieces broken off of this little transformer on this board, and because of that, it is actually completely loose, and it, it's essentially just hanging by its windings. I think it'll still work okay, and it'll probably be all right as long as it's not subjected to any rough handling from now on, but it is just something I noticed. The incoming power runs down to this board down here in the bottom, and that will be the power factor correction components. From there, the incoming power comes up to this rectifier block here, and there is some thermal compound between the rectifier block and just this metal uh, piece of the frame that it's bolted to here. There's no heat sink or anything, they're just relying on this metal to transfer the heat away from the rectifiers. There are some sort of bodged in components here and there on this welder, uh, one of the most glaring of which is this diode here, which is just kind of kind of after the fact, just kind of tacked on here and then some silicone on it to hold it. Um, not a big deal, but stuff like that just kind of makes this welder feel a bit prototypey, <laughs> and um, I don't know, just something I noticed. In the front, right behind the air filter here, are the arc contacts for the high frequency start. Uh, they're pretty easy to access if you ever did need to adjust those. In the front here, you can see another view of those uh, arc contacts right here behind these wires. Um, there's the, the arc gap. There's a solenoid valve here that has the argon hose and the compressed air hose coming into the back of it. And then out the front, it can send either one of those to the outlet here for the uh, plasma torch or TIG torch, depending on what you have hooked up. On this side, you can see the plasma cutter circuitry. The lower cooling fan is set back far enough that pretty much all the air is going to go on the back side of this partition behind this uh, board for the plasma cutter circuitry. So this lower fan will provide cooling airflow for the compressor, which is good, but it's really not gonna flow any air across these heat sinks or any of these components. And in fact, this vertical heat sink here almost completely blocks this opening, so it would be very difficult to actually push any air through there anyway. And this horizontal heat sink has the fins pointing down, so any heat radiating from those fins, it's going to kind of be trapped underneath there rather than being able to radiate up and out. So cooling for these components might be totally adequate, but considering the plasma cutter is rated at 100% duty cycle and can be used with a CNC table, the lack of airflow seems strange. And unlike the main heat sinks above, these ones don't appear to have any temp monitoring which could shut it down if it got too hot. Not a whole lot else to note on this side other than uh, this relay just kind of <laughs> stuffed down here and strapped to the air hose and the fact that while this silicone is kind of gooped on over top of the higher voltage terminals on here which will be pretty close to this side panel um, it's you know it's gooped on there but a lot of them are just sticking out straight through it. 
Overall, nothing stands out as too terrible, but it gives an impression of a bit of a clutch together design. As long as it works, I'm sure most won't care too much about what it looks like inside though. I will say that for whatever it's worth, this machine is very easy to take apart, at least to this level. The front and rear panels, um, they're, they don't have the feet integrated into them or anything like that. None of the front panels or anything like that are integrated into these removable pieces. So, you know, you just take the screws out, lift these off. You know, since the feet aren't integrated in them, I mean, you literally just unscrew them and pull them off with the welder sitting there. Very easy to take apart, again, to this level. And these plastic pieces seem to be, um, I don't know, maybe a bit better quality than some of the super rigid, brittle plastics that they've used on some other machines. I don't know if that's really a quality thing or not, but it is, I prefer them to be a little bit, a little bit less, uh, you know, super, super hard and brittle feeling. I, I prefer this feeling of the plastic over what they used to have. Again, for whatever that's worth. And unfortunately, I think that's gonna have to do it for part one. I know, a little anticlimactic, didn't get to do any of the testing or anything in this video, but I'm just running out of time today. Um, I will get it back together. And for part two, lots of testing and arc shots and all that. And fighter jets buzzing your house is something you're gonna have to live with when you live relatively close to an Air National Guard base. In the meantime, if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for what you want me to do in part two, let me know. As always, thanks for watching. Take care.